Hey guys, it's Leanne and I'm here today to talk about The Prestige. So if you've not seen the movie The Prestige and you've not read the book The Prestige, I would not recommend watching this video if you don't want to be spoiled for either because I will be spoiling both. So what we're doing today is talking about the book The Prestige as well as the movie The Prestige and the differences and comparing and contrasting them. So yeah, let's get into it. So I saw The Prestige when it came out, which is uh, quite a while ago now. It's it came out in the early 2000s. I saw it in theaters and then I've seen it a few more times since then. It's a favorite movie of mine. Not like an absolute favorite, but I have always liked it and I liked it a lot when it came out. And I think it's a good movie. Uh, like I think it's one that is fun to rewatch. Like a lot of movies, <laughs> once is enough, especially if they have a twist at the end. Like I'm not Shyamalan movies, like the first time you see it, it's a cool twist and after that it's not interesting. The Prestige is the kind of movie where it's fun to rewatch it and pick it apart after you already know the twist. So I have seen it probably at least four times or I had seen it probably at least four times before reading the book. And the most recent time that I had watched it before reading the book had been at least a year or two since I had seen the movie last before I picked up the book. And then just now I rewatched the movie after having read the book. So I didn't read the book prior to seeing the movie. I had already seen the movie. So I was spoiled insofar as if the book was like the movie, then I was spoiled for it, which they are different and they are same, different parts of them. The core story is the same and the twist is more or less the same. So that was the part that did kind of keep me on the edge of my seat. Even though I'd seen the movie, reading the book, I kept wondering, well, is it going to turn out the way that it did in the movie? And so at times I was like, it, it can't possibly be what it was in the movie. And other times I was like, well, it's gotta be what it was in the movie. So if you've seen the movie, you know that it stars Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman as two rival magicians and this is like the 1800s and the way that the movie tells it is it has these it keeps playing with the timeline keeps jumping back and forth between the present um where borden played by christian bale is in, imprisoned for the murder of angiers who's played by hugh jackman and so then we cut back to how they ended up one ended up dead and the other ended up imprisoned for his murder and within jumping back then we jump even more around to the movie constantly plays around with the timeline and constantly plays around with what you do and do not know and what the audience is shown and isn't shown. And despite how confusing that could be, Christopher Nolan does an exceptional job taking the audience through it in a way where you don't feel lost, even though it keeps jumping around like that. And then in addition to jumping around with the timeline, the way that it kind of, the vehicle through which it jumps the timeline is that these two men are reading each other's journals at various points in their life. So you kind of have flashbacks within flashbacks because you flash back to them reading the journal and then the journal itself is a flashback to the person having written the journal. So it's it's quite a nesting doll of story. The book is similar insofar as it has this narrative choice of having a journal be the vehicle through which you experience the past. However, while in the movie, the magicians are reading each other's journals, in the book, we are in the present day to start out with and it is a descendant of one of the magicians who was adopted, so he doesn't really know any of his family history. He's contacted by the descendant of the other magician and he begins to learn more about his family history and his own birth and origin and et cetera, et cetera. So I think that works a lot better in a book because then you, you're you kind of like, the, the reader and this person from the present day are kind of in the same boat experiencing the story. But for film, I absolutely approve of the choice of taking that out entirely and just having the magicians themselves reading each other's journals. I think it works better on film, so I, it is different and I think each one works better. Like, I don't think the book should be the way the movie was and I don't think the movie should be the way the book was. I think that was an excellent choice to make the movie that way. It works better for a film. And so that said, the where the movie ends also has to be different than the book because the book, again, circles back to the present day and brings it all back to how this is relevant to the characters in the present day. That character does not even exist in the movie. So it can't, that isn't the ending point and it can't be the ending point because it's just that thread does not exist. And the thing that it changed, uh, the movie changed and I think this is an excellent choice that actually the book would have benefited from and I think the book would be better if it had been more like the movie. The reason these rival magicians are rivals, like the origin of their rivalry, the origin of their feud, in the book it's a really thin and silly reason, which on some level I appreciate because quite often like notorious long-standing family feuds in history and in literature it will often be set off by something really quite small that then just kind of snowballs and escalates. So like on the one hand I appreciate the idea of something so small then escalating into this like huge rivalry that affects these men generations even thereafter. But I do think that the reason for the rivalry is so much more personal and so much more dramatic and so much more so much darker and more engrossing in the movie. In the book these two men don't really know each other at all except by reputation and not even really that. Borden kind of uh, encounters somebody who's kind of pretending to be 
a psychic, someone who's kind of pretending to be um, a medium, and he encounters this person because his own, I believe his aunt or his grandma or somebody in his own family is seeking solace for the death of a loved one and so hires this medium, and that is Angiers. And Angiers has been making his money early on in his career doing this rather than actually magic shows. And Borden thinks that this is like a really, I mean, <laughs> magic is inherently dishonest, but he thinks this is like, this is true, like, he's a true charlatan. He's like profiting off of the grief of uh, individuals, and Borden hates that. So then he sets about sabotaging uh, Angier's show or Angier's presentation. And then what Borden couldn't possibly have known is that Angier's wife, who's been helping him with his with this show or this this act of theirs, she's pregnant and so she nearly miscarries because of like the stress of like the disruption to the show. And Angier's holds Borden responsible for this, and then he tries to get he tries to get back at him at his shows and, and thereafter then it's kind of like the movie where they keep sabotaging each other's shows. But in the movie, they actually knew each other and worked together before. Um, and they weren't like friends or anything, but they worked pretty closely together because they both worked for another magician as assistants. And Angier's wife is also a, an assistant to this magician. And it's Borden's job to tie a knot for her uh, during a like an escape from water act. And like it's supposed to be a trick knot so that she can easily get out of it and then climb out of the of the water tank and appear to have escaped. However, Borden and the wife agreed to do a different knot than the one they've been using and she ends up not being able to get out of the knot and she dies. So in the book, the wife doesn't even die. She just kind of, she miscarries and like she, it's a life-threatening situation but she survives and, the, and they have another baby and like it's more or less fine. Like it's, it's harrowing but it's fine. And it's not really Borden's fault. I mean like it's indirectly Borden's fault that she ended up miscarrying but he didn't really set out to like hurt her in any way. Whereas in the movie, it is like literally Borden's fault that he tied a different knot, even though she agreed to it and then she dies. So, and the reason for Angiers to feel like he needs to get back at Borden for that is just so much more, so much darker and so much, it, it's just so much more personal. And you can really, like even though revenge is never healthy, vengeance is never a healthy quest to be on and, and, and the obsession that it turns into is not healthy for anyone. The healthiest thing as hard as that is is to walk away. But as the audience, like you can really appreciate why Angiers would not be able to walk away from that and why he would like hold on to this hatred for Borden because his wife is dead. So it doesn't matter that like Borden didn't intend for her to die. Like it's Loki his fault. So I think that choice in the movie is a good choice. And I think the book would have been stronger if that had been kind of the origin of their rivalry rather than just kind of like petty professional differences. Now another fairly big divergence from book to film is the way that Tesla's machine works. So in the book and the movie, Angiers is trying to figure out how Borden is able to do the transported man act where he appears to have transported himself from one place to another, you know, somehow magically. And Angiers is convinced that Borden is not using a double and he cannot figure out how he's done this. So Borden allows him to believe that the secret to his trick has something to do with Nikola Tesla. And so Angiers, both in the book and in the movie, seeks out Nikola Tesla and it gets Tesla, pays Tesla to create a machine for him. And this is where it becomes like pseudoscience paranormal. And that's true in both the book and the movie. So Tesla does build him a machine, but the way the machine works is different in the book versus in the movie. And the way that the machine works is different in the book in a way that ties in the present day plot, ties in this descendant that is now discovering his family history. That in no way, the way that the machine works, I don't know if that's why they changed how the machine works because they're, they decided to exclude this present day plot line. So in the movie, and this is the biggest spoiler of them all in case you were like kind of watching this but kind of hoping not to get spoiled. Like this is the end of the movie plot twist spoiler. So the way the machine works is it doesn't transport you, it duplicates you. Um, and that in the movie, that's how it works. So, you know, electric, lightning, whatever, like razzle dazzle. And once that happens, you don't disappear, you just reappear, a duplicate, a doppelganger reappears elsewhere. So now there's two of you. So in order for this to work for a transported man act, where it appears that the same person has been moved, uh, instead of a duplicate just being created and cloned instantaneously. So in order to get this act going and in order to not have many, many, many duplicates and doppelgangers of himself, if he performs this act many times, um, the way that Angiers solves that problem is by killing himself every single night. So when he performs the act, he ensures that of the two that exist once the machine is, is used, that one of them dies and the other survives. And then the next night, one of them dies and the other survives. So there's always just one of him at the end of the act, but he is committing suicide every single night in order to ensure that only one of him 
exists. So that's kind of what happens in the book, except the machine does it for you. The machine is not able to create life. It just, it creates like a second you, but the first you, it kind of like steals the soul out of you. So it leaves an empty shell, like a dead body. And it creates matter, but not life. So there is, it's kind of the same, but different because you don't, and you, he doesn't have to intentionally set about killing himself. The machine just basically creates a second shell of a human body and then transports the soul out of the one and into the other. So you wouldn't have this like constant doppelganger situation. Every time he uses the machine, like the initial body is emptied of its soul and then the soul is transported into the new body. So you do have bodies to get rid of, but he's not having to like intentionally kill himself because the machine kind of kills him, kind of, by taking the soul out. I think in the movie, it's again a stronger choice. The fact that Angiers is choosing to kill himself when the machine isn't the thing doing it. So in the movie, or I'm sorry, in the book, the only way to use this machine is to have this happen. There's not, I mean, it's a choice to use the machine, but it's not a choice to kill yourself because that's just how the machine works. So the fact that Angiers is choosing to kill himself in the movie every single night just for this act, I think is a dark, it makes it darker and it makes it more sadistic that he's willing to do this to himself. It's still sadistic in the book that he's willing to do this to himself, subject himself to, to the ordeal of using his machine, but because more agency is placed on the character in in the movie to actively choose to kill yourself as opposed to allowing doppelgangers of yourself to exist is just a darker choice. And I think for that reason, it sort of resonates more and sticks with you more. However, in the in the book, Andrew's just had a bunch of bodies to get rid of. So the descendant does find the bodies. But so what happened to the, him as a kid was that he thought he had a brother. And so for a while, I thought it was because the machine was doing that work. A, a double of him had been created, but that's not how the machine works in the book. So the machine was used on him as a little boy. So we kind of got re-sleeved. <laughs> But his initial body kind of, there's this like weird sentience that that is remains in the old bodies, like some awareness of the body existing. And that's what kind of calls to him and makes him think he's got a twin, but it's not a twin. It's just like his old shell. So I think I like the way the machine works better in the in the movie. I think it works better here. This like idea of like the soul being resleeved. It just it's needlessly messy and complex and it, it makes it both less dark and more complicated and I just I think the movie handled that better as well. And then another thing that the movie definitely absolutely handled better is the fact that this here's the other twist that absolutely is the big twist is that Borden was using a double this whole time. His double was a twin brother and throughout the entire movie you don't know that he's got a double and you don't know that he's got a twin. No one knows that he's got a twin because he's living he, he and his brother are living one life and they're both pretending to be the same person like in their personal life so that no one knows. Like they're that devoted to their craft. And that's true in the book as well. However, in the book, the way that it nods to their being twins is so much more obvious <laughs> that when I was reading it, I was like, it can't possibly be twins like it is in the movie because it's like literally telling us that there's twins. Like that can't be a twist because it's it's basically giving itself away constantly. Um, and I asked my friend who'd never seen the movie, who was also reading the book, I was like, let, like, I personally feel like everything is really obvious right now, but I won't tell you what the thing is. But you tell me if you feel like everything, like the, the, the twist is really obvious. And she's like, it was so obvious that she also was, even though she hadn't seen the movie, it was so obvious to her that this seems to be twins that she was like, it must be a misdirect. It can't possibly be twins because it's basically telling me that it's twins. So I think the movie does a much, much better job of, of having these kind of really, really subtle clues that you really do not pick up on unless you've already seen the movie. And that's why it's fun to rewatch it because there are all these moments where Borden says something that like, he's kind of a bizarre magician individual. So you kind of write it off as that, as being this kind of like bipolar guy. But if you know that there's twins cause you've seen the movie before on a rewatch, there's so many double meanings in what he says and so many double meanings in what he does that it's just so much more fun to pick apart on a rewatch. Whereas the book, it's so, it's like it's trying to be subtle and utterly failing and nodding at there being twins, but like so obviously that you're like, yeah, it's fucking twins. Like there's nothing fun to pick apart here. It's obviously twins. The twist is that there is no twist. <laughs> and then another thing that the movie handled better, absolutely 100% handled better was the female characters. In the book, you also have, you have Borden has a wife and Angier's obviously, I already mentioned the wife that in the movie she dies and and that's the beginning of the rivalry. In the book, he's got a wife that like, he mentions being upset, obviously, that she almost miscarried. That's why he hates Borden. But he ends up kind of like getting over his love of her and cheating on her. And she's just kind of like not in it much. And like, she's not really fleshed out as a character that would have her own motivations, really. She just kind of like exists as a plot device. And there's a third female character that I haven't mentioned at all, who works as an assistant first for Angiers and then for Borden. 
And she becomes, she was Angier's mistress, and then she becomes Borden's mistress. And that character is also used as a plot device more than a character in the book. Whereas in the film, again, she's more fleshed out. It's, it's more explored what her motivations and feelings about these two magicians would be, what would drive her to first attach herself to one and then be willing to betray him and attach herself to the other. And it's just a m much more fleshed out. We really, because we do, it's true both in the book and the movie that Borden is two men who have a wife and a mistress, but they both have the wife and they both have the mistress. So they have to, these women are meeting both of these men. And so in the book, it's just kind of like, well, that, like at some point, I think Angiers wonders like, well, she must have noticed, right? Like if there's twins, like... She has to, like a wife would have noticed, right? But it, that's it, that's like the only way it's addressed and that I wouldn't really call that addressing it. In the movie, it does a really good job showing Borden's wife kind of at first feeling kind of strange about things and like slowly kind of like really, really kind of losing it because it's like she's being gaslit in reverse. <laughs> like they're Borden, the Bordens are trying to convince her that everything is normal. <laughs> and she, because she knows it's not normal, then that, in that way she's like being gaslit because like, this isn't normal and she knows it's not normal and it's making her feel really uncomfortable and like and he he will not tell her <laughs> that there's two of him like the secret is he spent his whole life keeping the secret so he, like the fact that she's kind of like losing it over this like is much more uh well developed and explored in the film now i will say that um the end of the movie versus the end of the book the end of the book is a lot more like climactic yeah uh, if if that makes it's almost more cinematic. The end of the movie, it just kind of reveals to you both secrets. It reveals to you that Andrews has been killing himself and reveals to you that Borden really did have a twin brother this whole time. And it kind of leaves you to go, wow, both of those dudes were like really uber committed to this whole magic thing. Like one of them was living a half of a life and the other one was killing himself. And you're like, Jesus Christ, these two men are crazy. And just kind of leaves you to ponder that, which is a great ending. Like I still think it's a great ending. But in the book, because we have this present day situation where now this like, present day guy who's the descendant of Borden is like feeling that he's got a twin brother but realizing now with this whole machine that he's learned about from like reading the diaries of Angiers and Borden he is like okay because he remembers the machine being used on him or somebody remembers the machine being used on him so the fact that he goes down and he finds where all the bodies of Angiers are and then he finds his own unsleeved body and then like like there's a figure that is seemingly this specter that's like a remnant of Angiers that's kind of like chasing him and it's just this really eerie like dark mysterious like basement full of corpses thing that's like quite chilling and dark and kind of like oh shit oh shit oh shit whereas again the movie is just kind of like leaving you on this like somber note of like well fuck these dudes are crazy wow so the the book definitely like reaches more of like a like a heart thumping climax whereas the movie is more of a a somber philosophical ending. I recommend both, honestly. And like, even though I'd seen the movie and knew the twist already, reading the book was still an enjoyable experience. And rewatching the movie, knowing the twist is still enjoyable because picking apart all the ways that, that there are all these double meanings and all the ways that the there are misdirects and all the ways things are shown to you and hidden from you at the same time. Because Christopher Nolan's filming of it, he's not actually, like what I really hate is when mystery movies intentionally withhold information from the audience so you could not possibly have figured it out because you literally weren't told or shown the thing. He is actually showing you everything all the time. He's just like a magician misdirecting you. So when you rewatch it, you're like, yeah, it was technically there for me to see all along. Technically, you gave me the answers. And the uh, the narrator who's Michael Caine, and he's uh, Michael Caine is a character who, who is not in the book at all. And he's like, he knows both of the magicians in the movie. So he's kind of a thread that binds them. He says a couple of times as a voiceover, he asks the audience, are you paying attention? Because, you know, when you're watching a magician, like, are you, are you paying attention? And so it's, Christopher Nolan is almost, he's kind of teasing you with the fact that he's asked you to pay attention, he's told you that he's tricking you, he's shown you the thing and misdirected you and told you he's misdirecting you, and it still works because if you haven't, have you haven't seen it before, if you haven't read the book, you, uh, like, I, I would be very surprised if you watched it the first time not knowing anything and would guess the twists. And yet he has given you the pieces, given you the information to solve it before he tells you the answer. And even at the end, uh, Michael Caine says something about how, like, you, you do see it, but you don't want to work it out. Some part of you doesn't want to know what the trick is. And I just, I, I enjoy how he's messing with the audience that way in a way that's totally, it's totally honest. <laughs> he's not messing with you where he's withholding things. He has given you the pieces and been like, well, you gonna figure it out? Do you even want to figure it out? <laughs>
So I think it's an excellent, excellent film. And the book that it's based on, I mean, which made it possible because, I mean, it's a wild story that, like, credit where credit's due, like, to invent this story was kind of wild. And I think Christopher Nolan improved on it. So I would recommend both. I enjoyed both. But I would say I do see myself rewatching the movie several more times in my lifetime. I don't know that I would reread the book. Like, I, I, uh, I'm glad I read it. I enjoyed it. And I think it was interesting comparing the two. But I think the book is not going to be fun to pick apart <laughs> on a reread. The movie is still fun to pick apart every time I watch it. Every time I watch it, I catch something new. Some other little piece of it that I'm like, oh, and right there, yeah. And like, oh, I, that's what that means. <laughs> so both are great, but I think the movie's better. Let me know in the comments down below. Hopefully you've read or seen the movie. Hopefully at least one of the two, ideally both. <laughs> and if that's true, I would imagine the people watching this video are few and far between because I don't know that the book is very well, very widely read at all. I think more people have seen the movie. But in any case, let me know your thoughts down below about the movie, about the book, about my <laughs> assessment of both. If you enjoyed them, if you didn't, if you loved them, if you hated them, whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.